is Everyday Expertise, and I'm here today with Liam Gibbs. He's the Ottawa-based author of the superhero slash space opera parody series In a Galaxy Far, Far Awry, which is currently up to five volumes. Welcome. Hi. Hi. So uh, how did you get started in writing? Uh, that's a, a long story. I, um, I got started writing when I was about four years old, I'm told. So I don't remember all of the details, but it had something to do with my grandfather. Kind of, I guess what happened was I wrote a story uh, that had a cow going out into a field needing grass. Mm. And my parents must have shown somebody, they must have shown my grandfather. And so my grandfather, um, who is a writer, he was a writer himself. He was a technical writer. He wasn't a fiction writer. So he did like user manuals for like wartime tanks and stuff like that. Mm. But he had a writing background, which is the point. And um, he... Kind of, I guess he kind of encouraged me to, you know, he was like, go, go, try it out, try it out. You know, I guess when I could handle it a little more when I was a little older than four. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so I, it just kind of went from there. I, uh, I love things like, you know, Star Wars and the whole idea of going out into space and meeting space aliens and, you know, coming up with all these different gadgets and going to other planets and stuff. But I also loved the uh, whole comic book thing about... Mm -hmm. you know, what we could do with different powers and stuff like that. So I just stuck the two of those things together. Where the comedy came from, I have no idea. Uh, it must have come from somewhere. But anyway, that that element is still a mystery. But that's where uh, this came from. That's where my whole uh, writing background came from. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you describe your series for someone who hasn't read it and is not really familiar with it? I would say... Uh, Elevator pitch, it's, it's like X-Men and Spaceballs glued together. <laughs> or like uh, Justice League and uh, Futurama or mm -hmm. something like that. You take the comedy aspect and you take the space aspect and you take the, uh, the comic book aspect. And it's a perfect blending of the three of those things. Basic bad guy versus good guy. You have two teams that are fighting over the uh, galaxy. Mm -hmm. And so um, how did you come up with like the characters and, and all this? And the uh, the setting, and it's sort of set like in a sort of alternate future or something like this, or a far a far future. It, it was in the far future, essentially because I am not good at research, <laughs> and so I figured the the safest place to put this would be like really far in the future, where you know if I go so far in the future that we have no idea what we're gonna you know what we're gonna come up with or where we're gonna be and stuff. There's no realism mm -hmm. at all then nobody can nail me on any specific point. They can't be like, you know, well, you know, we're never going to be, you know, if I said in 2,500, you know, we're never going to colonize Andromeda by then. But, you know, in, in the year 90,000, in year, uh, sorry, 9,000, like who knows where mm -hmm. we're going to be. So I figured that would be the safest place to put it. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Okay, so this show is very much about process. Uh, can you walk me through your process uh, when you're um, when you're writing – uh, a volume, I guess. Um, what kind of planning do you do? Do you outline or do you sort of free write? I did uh, free write for the first few books of the series because I really didn't think it was going to do much. I didn't think it was going to matter. Um, for those of you not aware, uh, as I explained in the, in the prologue of the first book, I had a whole series <clears throat> based in this universe that I had kind of ditched. Mm -hmm. But it was originally like the first book of the series was originally supposed to be kind of an origin to those two books. So I didn't really think that the the stories would kind of stand alone as their own mm -hmm. things. I, didn't, I, I kind of just flung a bunch of ideas in there. And by the time I got to the end of it, I, I just saw what there was. So I didn't really plan much of the first, I would say, you know, six or seven books. But then I started getting into the idea of, oh, you know, maybe I should plan it. Everybody's talking about planning it. Maybe let's see what I come up with when I plan it. So I started planning books and uh, that worked out as well. And now it's funny that you asked me that question because now the current one that I'm writing right now, I decided oh, I'm going to go back to not having any plan at all and see what I'm going to come up with there. But I think even, even if a writer says that they don't plan anything at all, I think that there is some sort of something going on in the back of their mind like they they kind of know they probably know where it's going to end they might not know how they're going to get there but they probably know some specific points about where they're going to be even if they don't put it down on paper or on a you know in a notepad file or anything like, like right. that probably know sort of kind of what's going on so 
I'm sort of sitting in between the two of those things. I'm, I've sort of haven't planned anything, trying not to plan anything because I kind of don't want to ruin the surprise for me too. Mm. But at the same time, I sort of kind of know how things are going to be or, you know, major plot points and things like that. Mm-hmm. So you have, um, so you do sort of a, like as a hybrid of outlining and, and free writing. Yeah. Yeah. I would guess so. And then you do, uh, how many drafts would you say you do before you start editing? Like, uh, do you do beta reading and, uh, and stuff like this as well? Yeah, I got, uh, I got a couple of beta readers right now mm-hmm. and I don't dare show them a thing until probably about the eighth draft or so. Mm-hmm. And I even have kind of, uh, ideas of what I want to hit in each draft. So it's, it's, mm. it's pretty specific what I'm looking for in each draft. There was one time where I did show a friend of mine the first draft of one of them just because I wanted to. He was trying to write, and he was he was not um, confident in his writing because, you know, the first draft, it looks crap. I can't get past the first page. Mm. And I showed him the first draft, and I said, look, everybody's first draft is crap. And that was the only time I ever showed anybody anything uh, up until probably the eighth draft of anything that I've ever done. Mm. Cool. So uh, I've, been, I've some, I'm nearly done the first book, and I've noticed there's a big theme in the series. Seems to be a sort of like um, maybe over commercialization. Sort of yeah. this, the, the sort of like um, there's the advertising is just it, it's so everywhere. That it's really, it's like in the background, it's like background noise for your characters. And it's also, it's used for comic effects quite a bit. Is that how you sort of, uh, you see the future? <laughs> it's like a lot of advertising everywhere. It's everywhere already. I think this is just even natural. It's like even that. more. Yeah. I For me, setting is sort of also a character. Mm-hmm. Like when you have kind of, when you create the setting, you have to kind of give it characteristics. Because, you know, each... Even nowadays, each, you know, like country, each region has different cultures and different set and different, um, you know, dialects and stuff like that. So, I mean, setting has to be a character almost on its own. Mm. So I figure, how am I going to make this funny, but also kind of inject a little bit of realism into it as well? Oh, let's advertise. And advertising is is rife with comedy because even nowadays you can you know every Super Bowl commercial has to ha- has to be comedic right they all have to they all have to hit you at a certain time and a certain way and a certain mood and I figured just putting a ton of advertising even in the military to the point where advertising almost rules how the military works and how the the government works and how the the um, the galaxy works I would just inject a ton of comedy and sort of almost be realistic uh, to the point of being scary almost. Mm -hmm. But then you have this, you have this main character that just hates all of it. Like even this, even technology really. He's disenchanted. Like advanced technology. He's deathly afraid of it. (laughs) I love how like characters just have to like stop and like give a commercial. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's all you're, you're talking about the first couple of chapters there. Yeah. They were, they're legally obligated. <laughs> to, their sponsors are before they get into the whole conversation. Yeah. 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 Or like, or this was the meeting where he, um, I don't want to give any too much spoilers where something very important happens to the main character. And then like uh, during the whole thing, the person is eating these cookies that he has to, that he's trying to force <laughs> him to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, um, so speaking about all, all of that, then uh, your what would you, what would you say are your major influences in your writing? Major influences I would say are Marvel Comics and Star Wars. So I'd say mm-hmm. like you know equal parts of George Lucas and Stan Lee. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean obviously there's there's little bits and pieces in there, and uh, I'm gonna I might probably throw out a couple names that nobody's ever heard, but they'll have heard of the the series. So Fabian Nicieza, as mm-hmm. far as um, writing goes, he wrote a comic series called New Warriors, which was my all-time favorite comic. It still is my all-time favorite comic series. And I know nobody's ever heard of him, but he's the creator of Deadpool. So everybody's everybody's looking up Deadpool now. Like, what's this guy's name? I think think probably a lot more people know his name now. (laughs) Yeah, they know his name now. There was him. There was um, um, F. Paul Wilson. He wrote uh, a book series, not a comic book series, an actual book series called uh, Repairman Jack. Mm. And uh, I don't know if the book series actually has a official name, but that's the kind of the, the name it's known by. 
repairman Jack, and he was a big influence of mine. It has nothing to do with comedy or space. It's kind of the here and now. Mm-hmm. Um, there is obviously, you know, everybody's comparing it to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Yes, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. <laughs> um, as far as non literary influence, the, there's, you know, Seinfeld, obviously Spaceballs. Spaceballs is in there all over the place. You know, the Star Wars thing, the whole, you know, Futurama. Um, anything that has to do with space, I kind of gobble it up when I was a kid and saw so here I am still gobbling that stuff up. Mm-hmm. Um, those would be the major influences. And also, and I know this has nothing to do with horror, but I, I watched a lot of stupidly bad horror movies when I was a kid. So some of it must have gotten in here somehow. <gasps> well, the sort of comedic gore, I guess. I, yeah. Those, <laughs> I felt like, <laughs> every writer puts themselves into what they're writing and, and horror is a big part of me growing up. So it must've gotten in there somewhere. So somebody's probably opening up, Oh, there's, there's alien right there. Or there's, you know, uh, you know, there's the shining right in there or something. I have no idea, but somebody might pick that up somewhere. Mm. All right. Um, what's something you wish you'd known about writing before you started? Before that, what, what what do you wish? Well, okay, maybe past four years old because you didn't really know what you were doing. But when you really sort of sat down and was like, "I'm going to be a writer," is there something you wish you'd known before that? What I wish I'd known before that. First of all, don't use adverbs. <laughs> uh, Stephen King will will come out of he'll jump through your window and, and slap you if you use adverbs. Um, the other thing is, and uh, I guess I kind of knew it, but didn't know that I knew it. So I didn't really, um, wasn't really good at it, I guess, was just making, you know, giving rich character backstories. Because when I was growing up, when I was a kid, you know, 12, 13 or whatever, I just kind of threw things in there. I didn't really know about character backstories. And I mean, I know that I, you know, I read books and I read comic books and I watch movies. So I kind of, you know, some of it sort of got in there. But I wish I'd known that because I would have worked with it a little bit better when I was growing up. I mean, it, you know, it worked out in the end. You know, here I got a book series, and they got rich character backstories. I hope people find them rich. But, um, you know, I kind of wish that I practiced this a little bit early, earlier than I did. Mm. All right. Um, how do you integrate your writing into your daily life, if you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm on a lot of uh, Facebook writing groups, and everybody's yeah. talking about how many words did you write? How many pages did you write today? I try to write... 2,500 pages a day, and, and here I am going, this is how many words I write a day. I try to write getting my kids to brush their teeth and get in bed number of words a day. Um, so it's really tough. There, there are some days that I don't, I'm not able to integrate writing into it at all. Like sometimes I just can't find the time between having two jobs, having a family, blah, 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 blah trying to stay awake. Sometimes I can't, sometimes I go a day without writing. Sometimes I go two days without writing. Sometimes I go a week without writing. Sometimes it's all about, I'm going to work on my writing tape, but I'm going to work on the public facing aspect of it. So it's, how do I integrate that into my life? It's some, I'll let you know when it happens, I guess. Um, Sometimes I just have to close the door and and just write. Yeah, that's totally normal. Yeah, the only the only way sometimes you can do it is you you don't you just have to do take care of all of your life responsibilities and then close the door, stay up late, and just pound out some pages. Mm-hmm. So how do you cope with stress or obstacles in the pursuit of your writing? Again, I will let you know. <laughs> uh, it's 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 hard, I guess, sort of to to kind of cope with with the stresses of life and stuff like that. And sometimes you just have to go. This is the thing that I set out to do because I enjoyed it. I didn't want to start writing because I was going to make it a furiously stressful career. I, I set out because I actually enjoy doing this. And you remind yourself, OK, I'm sitting down and I'm writing and, you know, I enjoy this type of thing. You know, let me get you know, you know let me get my environment. If I got to, you know, if I got a drink that I like to to drink while I'm writing, let me grab that. Let me put on whatever music drown out all of your responsibilities and just, just remind yourself, this is, this is something I enjoy doing Mm -hmm. and just, just allow yourself, you know, tell yourself, 
you deserve to have the half an hour, 45 minutes that you have, or, you know, all the kids are at their friend's house. I have two hours. I deserve the time that I can just sit down, relax and, and do what I set out to enjoy. Mm. Do you get block? All, all the time. Mm. How do you every, cope with every, that? Um, you just, you keep writing, mm. you get block. And, and you know, when you write and when you write on writer's block, it's not going to come out good. Um, but that's what the second draft is for. That's what the third draft is for. If you always sat down to write when you were inspired, you would never get anything done. Mm. And there are some times where, and this is a comedy series, and the comedy is at the forefront, and there's some times where I can go two, three pages without being able to think of a single decent joke. Mm. And that's when you put filler um, grade school jokes in so that you can go back and you can go, okay, this joke didn't work, but I'm going to, this, you know, it's kind of like a place mark. I'm going to put another joke in there when I don't have writer's block, when I'm feeling mm. it. But when you have writer's block, you still write and you still create. And then you go, I'm going to worry about making this a masterpiece later. Mm. That makes sense. I hope it does. <laughs> All right. Uh, what would you say is your favorite aspect of writing? My favorite aspect of writing is just the character creating, I think. Mm -hmm. um, coming up with characters that are supposed to be funny and then the characters that are not supposed to be funny. There are two types of characters I have in here. There's the, there's characters that are comic relief and the characters that are not comic relief and the characters that are comic relief are, are easy, hmm. obviously for, for obvious reasons. And the characters that are not comic relief, you have to still have to find, how am I going to make them funny? If there's no comic relief characters in this scene, how am I going to make this scene funny? And um, one of the aspects that I love about writing is trying to find little ways of trying to, get the comedy still in there with those characters and creating the characters and trying to figure out how the non-funny characters are still supposed to be funny. Mm -hmm. Like a challenge that you like to overcome. It's <laughs> cool. All right. Uh, least favorite aspect, something that frustrates you. Something that frustrates me is probably the, the marketing of it. Cause I have never been a good marketer coming up mm. with the, <clears throat> the back cover description trying to trying to get it out there and trying to trying to balance you know i'm serious about my writing mm -hmm. but i want i don't want it to come across as stuffy because it's a comedy series you know i want the comedy in there but i want people to to understand that i'm taking it seriously like i'm not trying to goof off with this thing mm -hmm. and so I'm trying to find the balance there it's probably the hardest least favorite part well, yeah, I think that would be. Are you? Are you? Uh, I don't remember. Are you self-publishing, or are you? Uh, yeah. You have someone. Okay. So, um, well, how's your experience been with that? With, um, get, with getting that done, and and how did you come to the decision to to go that route? Okay, there's a story there. Um, like I'd had a couple of bites from some some agents and um, you know, publishing houses and stuff like that, but I figured they wanted to take self-control. And um, the whole thing about publishing houses is, is the the idea is that they will back you, and, and they do back you. Like they will they will back all the money, and they will do all of the marketing for you, and they will do you know they will set up you know they will put it in this bookstore and that bookstore, and they will they will be the ones to make you famous. But mm. the reality is they will be the ones who are backing um, you know Danielle Steele and Dean Koontz and all of them. You won't really matter much to them, you know, and unless you prove yourself, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I figured, why take away all the fun um, of doing, you know, the fun parts of publishing um, without, you know, any of the real kind of the, the benefits, you know, with benefits are going to Stephen King and J.K. Rowling and all them. Um, and not me. Why Why go with the publishing houses? So I took back the control and um, I was on Facebook one day and there was a, you know, a Facebook acquaintance was saying, you know, I'm here I am. I'm on um, Kickstarter and I'm kickstarting my book. Hmm. I thought, I got a book. Why don't I do that? So I got on Kickstarter and uh, I, I got really lucky because my Kickstarter campaign, I think I started it like too quickly and I kind of didn't know you know how Kickstarter word. If, if if you're trying to do a Kickstarter campaign, start it a year before you actually finish it. Hmm. What I mean is prepare it for about a year or so. And I prepared it for a couple months and I got lucky. 
somehow. And uh, that's that's how it worked out. And the first, uh, you know, I tried to get the first book bankrolled and I actually ended up getting two books bankrolled out of that. Um, you know, yay me. And so I got the first two out and then, you know, sales kind of continued to get the third and the fourth and the fifth and then soon the sixth, I hope so. But that's, uh, that's how the self-publishing thing worked and, and mm. you know, having the fun of going out and meeting the people that you're that are reading your books instead of just, you know, the bookstore is going to sell it to them instead. You know, I'd like to be the one to sell it to them. I'd like to be the one who's talking to them. I'd like to be the one who's making the book series famous. You know, it's my baby. Why am I letting the publishing house tell me how to, you know, what are the covers going to look like? What are the, you know, what's the title going to be? Mm-hmm. You know, change this, change that. This is the editor you're going to use. You know, it's my baby. I'm going to take control back. And that's how it started. Are you doing the covers or do you have someone doing them? I got somebody doing them. If I yeah. um, drew the covers myself, they, they would, holy crow, they would be atrocious. <laughs> they would be so bad. <laughs> no, I have I have somebody who's doing the covers for me. Okay. They're nice covers. Thank you. Yeah. I'll pass the word along. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well we've we've talked about a lot, but do you have any uh any more advice for people who are starting out in writing? If you're starting out in writing, uh like I said earlier, if you think that it's you know it's supposed to be fun and why am I not having fun with this part of writing? Don't worry, that is completely normal. Not everything is supposed to be uh, inspired. So if you're hitting roadblocks, you're hitting writer's block, it's perfectly normal. If you think, oh, I'm not cut out to be a writer, everybody's cut out to be a writer. It just takes the practice. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're having trouble with something, there's no reason why you got to bump around in the dark. Um, you know, even though uh, experience is the best teacher, jump on Facebook, jump on Twitter, jump on something, jump, you know, find some something in your city learn how to overcome these things, get people to read what you're writing. Even if it's the first draft and you're not sure about what's going on, let somebody read it and make some comments. Mm. Um, But don't worry. Writing is not always going to be inspirational. All you have to do is get your butt in the chair, get some words on the paper and you've done your job. Cool. I think that's some good advice. I hope so. (laughs) All right. So yeah, I think we're kind of, we're basically the point where uh, I would say, how can people find out more about you and your work? Just jump on uh, jump on the internet. Go to www.inagalaxyfarfarari.com. Mm-hmm. It's exactly like the famous tagline. Just change the last A to an R. Mm-hmm. Or you can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter. You can find me on LinkedIn. Can't find me on Google Plus anymore because they shut that down. <laughs> You can find me on Instagram, although I have to warn you, I have no idea how I'm using Instagram. <laughs> so I might be making a huge mess of Instagram. I'm uh, ruining it for everybody else. Or you can just email me at liamgives at inagalaxyfarfarri.com. Mm. Or if you're in the Ottawa area, keep watching, bump into me wherever I'm going to show up. Yeah. Do you have anything uh, coming up? Any appearances or anything? I'm going to be at uh, Cornwall. Um, what is it? It's called Cape Cornwall area pop event next weekend so what are we the we're the 21st right now so that's on the 27th and the 28th after that is ottawa comic-con and i know i'm missing a couple in here but then i'm jumping ahead to montreal comic-con i've also got Fanaticon here in august and uh <clears throat> just keep watch on uh, there's an appearances uh, section on my website and if you keep watch on there i got everything listed awesome thanks liam Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for watching. This has been Everyday Expertise. I'm Angela. Bye. I'm Liam. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this interview. Be sure to share this video with friends and colleagues who may also enjoy this topic. Let us know your thoughts by leaving a comment below or check the description for our social media. See you next time.